For a century, the Duponts had built their gunpowder empire along Delaware's Brandywine River, where each morning fathers would kiss their children goodbye, knowing it might be for the last time. And the family lived and died by a simple code. Every Dupont son started in the powder yards, learning to gauge quality by taste and touch, running toward explosions while others fled. Yet, by 1902, three cousins from a new generation were locked in a struggle for control of what would be worth a staggering $3.6 billion today. But these were men who believed in boardrooms over powder yards, and their battle for supremacy would tear apart America's greatest industrial dynasty. Thus, in today's episode, we'll share the full history of the multi-billion dollar fight for total control, as we describe the DuPont family war, when old money battles for America's greatest fortune. The city is Wilmington, Delaware, and the year is 1902, and the age of family business was ending. But one dynasty refused to fade. And in a sprawling estate overlooking the Brandywine River, Alfred I. DuPont sat at his grandfather's desk, running calloused fingers over the wooden surface where three generations of powder kings had signed their orders. At 38, he had already given more to the family business than most men give in a lifetime, including his left eye, lost while saving workers from an explosion in 1890. But in the DuPont family, sacrifice was currency. Since 1702, when Eluter Irene Dupont fled the French Revolution to build America's first powder mills, the family had lived by one rule. The company comes first. They measured time not in years, but in explosions. The inevitable cost of turning simple saltpeter into the gunpowder that built a nation. The powder yards along the Brandywine were more than just a business. They were an emblem of Dupont determination. Each building was positioned precisely 400 feet from its neighbors. A calculation written in blood after early explosions taught the family that closer spacing meant higher death tolls. The walls were built paper thin on three sides, with only the riverside wall fortified, ensuring any explosion would blow outward, away from the water wheel that powered the mills. Alfred had learned the business literally from the ground up. At age 12, he was already working the powder yards, learning each step of the dangerous process. By 20, he knew every worker by name. His hands-on experience and technical innovations had helped push DuPont toward dominance in America's powder production, with the company's market share growing larger each year. The family's success was built on an ironclad tradition. Every DuPont son started in the yards. They learned to gauge powder quality by taste, to detect dangerous conditions by smell, to know by touch when the mixture was right. They lived in identical houses along the Brandywine, each within running distance of the mills. When explosion alarms rang, DuPonts ran toward danger, not away from it and the DuPonts were known for their hands-on management of the powder works. Unlike many industrial dynasties of the era, family members regularly worked in the yards and laboratories. In fact, this dangerous work claimed the lives of both workers and DuPont family members, including Lamet DuPont in 1884. By the turn of the century, the family business had become America's primary powder supplier. Their products had armed the Union Army, broken through mountain ranges for railroads, and fueled America's westward expansion. The DuPont name wasn't just on paperwork, it was carved into the nation's bedrock. But as the new century dawned, a new generation was rising, one that believed in boardrooms over powder yards, in financial engineering over chemical engineering. Led by Alfred's cousins Pierre and Coleman, these young DuPonts had degrees from MIT and fancy offices in Philadelphia. They spoke of diversification, modernization, efficiency, to Alfred, these were just fancy words for forgetting who you were. The clash was inevitable. Old money versus new thinking. Tradition versus transformation. The powder yard versus the boardroom. But what no one could predict was how personal it would become, or how it would reshape American capitalism itself. The first shot in the DuPont Civil War wasn't fired with gunpowder. It was delivered in a memo. In 1914, Pierre Dupont, armed with graphs and efficiency studies from his newly established statistics division, proposed a radical restructuring of the family business. The old system, where each family member managed their own department with near-complete autonomy, would be replaced by a modern corporate structure. 
Professional managers would replace family members. Scientific management would replace handshake deals. For Alfred, who had spent decades in the powder yards and lost an eye in a dynamite-making accident in 1890, it was more than a business proposal. It was an attack on everything his grandfather had built. The memo proposed eliminating the department structure that had defined DuPont's operations for generations. The family's weekly dinners, once forums for easy conversation and business discussion, became battlegrounds. Cousins who had grown up together now barely spoke. The three-person executive committee meetings, where Alfred, Pierre and Coleman were meant to guide the company's future, became increasingly contentious. Pierre and Coleman's vision was ambitious. They wanted to transform DuPont from a family-run powder business into a modern chemical corporation. Their plans included establishing dedicated research laboratories, creating separate divisions for different product lines, and implementing a centralized management structure based on methods pioneered by railroads and steel companies. The changes they proposed were fundamental. The traditional system, where family members learned the business from the ground up and managed their departments based on personal experience, would be replaced by professional managers trained in modern business methods. Decision-making would shift from individual family members to corporate committees. Efficiency would take priority over tradition. But Alfred saw this modernization as a threat to everything the DuPont name stood for. While Pierre and Coleman spoke of efficiency and profitability, Alfred thought of the generations of family members who had built the business through personal relationships and hands-on management. He witnessed long-serving family members being pushed aside in favor of professional managers with business degrees, but no powder yard experience. The dispute quickly moved beyond mere business disagreement. It became a battle over the very soul of the company, whether DuPont would remain a family business or become something entirely new. Pierre and Coleman sought support from family members and shareholders who believed in their vision of a modern chemical corporation. Alfred found allies among those who valued tradition and family control. As 1914 drew to a close, it became clear that this conflict couldn't be resolved through normal family channels. The battle lines were drawn, and both sides were preparing for what would become one of the most dramatic corporate conflicts in American business history. In January 1915, the simmering DuPont family conflict finally spilled into public view through the pages of the Wilmington Morning News. The dispute, previously confined to boardrooms and family dinners, became a matter of public record as Alfred I. Dupont voiced his opposition to his cousin's management. He challenged their modern business approaches and what he saw as a departure from the company's traditional values. What made this conflict extraordinary, explains corporate historian James Clark, was how it transformed from a private family matter into a public debate about the future of American business. Pierre and Coleman Dupont responded by defending their vision of a modern corporation. They emphasized the benefits of professional management and scientific business methods. Their arguments centered on the need for DuPont to evolve beyond its traditional powder-making roots. The public nature of this dispute was particularly shocking given the DuPont's historical preference for privacy. The family had always maintained a careful distinction between their public image and private affairs. This conflict shattered that tradition. Alfred's criticisms focused on what he viewed as the abandonment of hands-on management principles. Having worked in the powder yard since his youth and having lost an eye in a dynamite-making accident, he embodied the traditional DuPont approach of direct involvement in the company's operations. The workforce found themselves witnessing a profound transformation. The company they knew, built on personal relationships and traditional manufacturing methods, was being reshaped by new management theories and corporate structures. As spring approached, the stage was set for a showdown that would reach far beyond the boardroom, one that would help define the very nature of modern American business. The 10th of May, 1915. The Hotel DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. And the annual stockholders meeting of E.I. DuPont de Nemours and Company marked a pivotal moment in American business history. The location itself spoke volumes. The Hotel DuPont, opened just two years earlier in 1913, represented the company's evolution from a gunpowder manufacturer to a modern corporation. 
its Italian Renaissance architecture and grand ballroom stood as monuments to the wealth that three generations of powder making had created. Security was unusually tight that morning. The past months of public conflict had drawn unprecedented attention to what had traditionally been a routine corporate event. Reporters from major newspapers gathered in the lobby, aware they were witnessing a turning point in American business history. The meeting brought together DuPonts, who had been avoiding each other for months. Coleman DuPont, the company's president, and Pierre, who had been instrumental in modernizing the company's financial structure, represented the progressive wing of the family. Their allies included a new generation of professionally trained managers and outside investors who supported their vision of scientific management. Alfred I. DuPont, who had started working in the powder yards at age 12 and had spent four decades in the family business, led the opposition. His supporters included many of the old guard family members who believed in maintaining traditional management methods. The primary item on the agenda was the election of directors. But everyone knew this vote represented something far more significant. It was a referendum on the company's future direction, whether to maintain its traditional character as a family-run powder maker or transform into a modern chemical corporation. When the proxy votes were counted, the results were decisive. Pierre and Coleman's slate of directors won with 58% of the shares. The victory represented more than just a change in leadership. It signaled the triumph of professional management over family tradition, of scientific efficiency over personal relationships, of the modern corporation over the family business. The meeting's minutes record that Alfred left immediately after the vote. Within days, he would begin liquidating his substantial holdings in the company his grandfather had founded. The cousins who had once worked side by side would never reconcile. A new era was dawning, one where family tradition would increasingly give way to professional management, where scientific efficiency would replace personal loyalty, and where the very nature of American capitalism would be transformed. The question that remained was, could any company truly prosper after losing its soul? Today, DuPont stands as a global chemical giant, its transformation from a family powder business to a modern corporation complete. The historic powder yards along the Brandywine River operate as the Hagley Museum, preserving the physical remnants of the company's origins. Where workers once carefully mixed volatile black powder, tourists now walk safely through restored buildings and machinery. The aftermath of the 1915 shareholder battle reshaped both the family and the company. Alfred I. Dupont, after losing control of the family business, redirected his entrepreneurial energy southward. He established himself in Florida, where he built an entirely new business empire in real estate and banking. His ventures helped develop Jacksonville and other parts of Florida during the 1920s land boom, proving his business acumen extended far beyond powder making. Pierre and Coleman's victory ushered in a new era for DuPont. Under their leadership, the company expanded far beyond its explosives roots. During World War I, they successfully diversified into new chemical products and pioneered modern management techniques. The company established one of America's first industrial research laboratories, leading to breakthroughs in synthetic materials that would transform both the company and American industry. The 1915 conflict's impact extended far beyond Delaware. It became a case study in the transformation of American business, marking a crucial shift from family-centered enterprises to professionally managed corporations. The DuPont story demonstrated how modern management techniques could successfully scale up family businesses into industrial giants. The company Pierre and Coleman built became a blueprint for corporate America. They introduced organizational structures still studied in business schools today, including the multi-divisional format that allowed for unprecedented growth and diversification. Their emphasis on research and development set standards for industrial innovation that influenced American business for generations. Yet the price of progress was personal. The DuPont family's unity, carefully maintained through four generations, never fully recovered from the 1915 split. The rise of professional management gradually reduced the family's direct involvement in day-to-day -day operations, though their influence continued through board positions and stock ownership. The Brandywine powder yards, now silent, stand as monuments to both tradition and transformation. They remind us that every business evolution 
carries human costs, that progress often requires painful choices between preservation and adaptation. The DuPont story remains relevant today as family businesses worldwide face similar challenges of modernization and scale. The company's transformation from a family powder works to a global chemical giant demonstrates how American business itself evolved, from personal to professional, from traditional to modern, from family-led to corporately managed. In this evolution, something was gained and something was lost. The question of which path was right, Alfred's traditional approach or Pierre and Coleman's modernization, continues to resonate in boardrooms and family businesses today. And now, we'd love to see you in the comments. Which side would you have taken? Alfred's traditional approach or Pierre and Coleman's modernization. Our channel thrives on your thoughts, so don't be shy and be sure to leave us a sentence or two. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury, and cheers until next time.